Hey everybody, my name is Dr. Scott Giacomucci. I'm the director and founder of the Phoenix Center for Experiential Trauma Therapy in Media, Pennsylvania. I'm board certified in clinical social work and psychodrama, and I'm an experiential therapy trainer and educator. I'm really uh, excited that you found this video, and I hope that you find it helpful in your work. This is part of an ongoing video series highlighting my recently published book, Social Work, Sociometry, and Psychodrama, Experiential Approaches for Group Therapists, Community Leaders, and Social Workers. In this video series, we'll be going through the book chapter by chapter to articulate some of the content of the book, to warm you up to the book, perhaps, or to help you further understand, process, and digest the content and the processes that are outlined in this book. If you haven't already gotten a copy of the book, you can download it for free online at Springer, uh, Springer Nature's website, the publisher, or on Amazon through their ebook platform. If you do find the book helpful, I would uh, be incredibly grateful if you considered leaving an Amazon review, an honest Amazon review, about the book so that we can help uh, reach future audiences. In this video, we'll be focusing on Chapter 5 of the book. Chapter 5 is on sociometry and social work theory. The social atom is a, another really core sociometric uh, theory and intervention assessment tool. Uh, it really can be used in a number of different ways. A social atom is basically a depiction of one's social network. The, the closest relationships within one's social network. Uh, the social atom is created by having an individual draw themselves on the center of a page and then draw the closest relationships surrounding them on that page. And when they draw uh, those relationships, traditionally there is different shapes that are used for different genders, which I don't think is, is very... Um, it, it's too outdated, and it's it doesn't fit with uh, modern times. Um, it, it's very binary and isn't very inclusive for non-binary and transgendered folks. So I, I don't think it's a very useful way of doing the social atom or genograms for that matter. Uh, one of my social work students, uh, Jordan, uh, had a great suggestion that we allow clients to use whatever shapes they want to represent the different people in their life <coughs> rather than prescribing certain shapes for men and certain shapes for women. And when we do this, uh, we actually get a whole lot more information about their perception of that person when they're allowed to use whatever shape they want to, dr to depict that person on their social atom. So I suggest, uh, uh, using these instructions for the social atom instead of the traditional ones. So the client draws himself in the center, then they use shapes based on size and proximity in relationship to themselves on the page to depict the other important people in their life. Uh, drawing that shape to size, to scale, based on how much space that person takes up in their life or how much space they give that person in their life. And then they're also drawing the shape in proximity to themselves using closeness or distance based on how close or how far away they feel to that person. And then the actual line connecting them to that person on the page indicates the nature of the relationship. So traditionally, a, a straight, uh, solid line indicates a connected relationship. A squiggly line can represent a conflicting relationship. A dotted line could represent a lost relationship. And there's a lot of different ways uh, of, of creating the social atom. So at its core, though, the social atom is a depiction of one's social life, the important relationships in one's social life. And you can see a pretty strong connection already to the social work field. The social atom is a way of operationalizing person and environment theory and that we're considering considering the individual within their social environment. 
There's a ton of different ways to create the social atom and ways to modify it for different clients, different goals, different situations, different communities. Some of the, the, the different ways it's been modified include rather than only putting relationships, individuals on the social atom, you could invite clients or participants to also uh, include groups, communities, collectives, or organizations that they're a part of or in relationship to on the social atom. Uh, in substance use treatment, it's pretty common to instruct clients to draw a social atom, but to also include a depiction of their relationship to their substance of choice or to alcohol on their social atom, which can illuminate a lot uh, for the client. In eating disorder treatment, many times uh, one's relationship to food or different types of food can be included on the social atom. There's ways of modifying it to be more strength-based, where you could have clients uh, draw their strengths in the format of a social atom. Uh, it can be uh, really modified uh, in a whole lot of different ways. There's, there's a lot of room for spontaneity and creativity really in all of psychodrama and sociometry practice. Um, and if you watch the video on chapter four, you would remember that psychodrama and sociometry are based on spontaneity creativity theory. So when we're drawing a social atom, it can be drawn in the here and now. Draw a here and now depiction of the current state of your social circle, your social life. It can be drawn based on a moment in the past. So we might say to a client, I want you to think about when you were in the depths of your heroin addiction years ago, or months ago, or weeks ago. I want you to draw a social atom that depicts the nature of your social life and your relationships at that point in time. And we can compare it to a drawing of the social atom today, which can be really useful. And we can also draw future social atoms. We could invite a client to draw a ideal future social atom. What would you like your social atom to look like a month from now, a year from now? It can be really useful as an assessment tool and as a, a treatment planning tool. There's been times where I've uh, invited clients to draw a social atom based on what they would like their social life to look like in the future. This is especially helpful for clients who struggle with social skills or social anxiety or, or relationships, and that you're helping them create a concrete vision, a depiction of what they would like their relationships and social life to look like. I found this to be probably the most efficient and helpful assessment of one's social life. There's been times where I've worked with individual psychotherapy clients and over the course of uh, meeting with them, talking with them, interviewing them, asking them to fill out intake paperwork. They've told me bits and pieces about their relationships and social life. And uh, I'm thinking of a specific case where after months of working together, I, I w still felt like I didn't know, I, I didn't have all the information I wanted or needed about their social life. And I asked them to draw a social atom for me to depict their their relationships. And, and I got more information out of them drawing that social atom, which took 10 or 15 minutes, than hours and hours of meetings over the past several months with that client. So this can be an incredibly helpful assessment tool. Um, it, historically, it's interesting to note that the social atom which seems to have been created all the way back in the early part of the 1900s, maybe 1930s, about the 1930s, that it influenced the later development of the genogram and eco-maps, which are particularly popular in the social work field and in family, uh, family work, family systems, family therapy. So there's a, another historical connection here between social work and psychodrama. 
Uh, Moreno talks about the social atom as the smallest of the social structures and that the social atom is composed of various uh, interpersonal relationships. Uh, so multiple relationships make up the social atom. Then multiple social atoms integrate together, creating social networks. And multiple social networks integrate together, creating society as a larger group. And so one's social atom is constantly changing, although there seem to be patterns that reemerge within the social atom. And perhaps this could be related to attachment styles, uh, relational reenactments, or what Moreno calls sociostasis. This is actually a term that, that Moreno coined nearly a hundred years ago, which has been uh, popularized more recently by some of the interpersonal neurobiologists who are starting to use this term uh, without reference to Moreno. Uh, sociostasis describes, uh, uh, think of it as homeostasis in the social context, that there's uh, layers and layers of attractions and repulsions within our relationships, within our social atoms, within society, within our social networks, within all of our relationships and that we're constantly trying to find balance within that system of attractions and repulsions. And so that point of balance, that threshold where we feel balanced and held within our relationships is what Moreno refers to as sociostasis. And so again, we find connection to person and environment theory. Moreno suggests that this network this, these layers of attractions and repulsions within our social atom are responsible for many of the internal intrapsychic tensions that human beings experience. So uh, this is where Moreno was a bit radical compared to some of his colleagues a hundred years ago, uh, where he was suggesting that psychological issues were in part or entirely caused by relationships or lack of. Again, here we find connection to Moreno and social work philosophy. In 1953, this would be in the second edition of Who Shall Survive, Moreno writes that every individual functions in a system which is confined by two boundaries, the emotional expansiveness of their own personality and the socio-emotional pressure exerted upon him by the population. So uh, <laughs> again, this sounds a whole lot like social work philosophy. Uh, while Moreno's work is most, he's mostly known as a psychodramatist and psychodrama is definitely the most popular of, of his work. It's important to keep in mind that uh, sociometry uh, was not just an approach to therapy, but really a systems theory. Moreno wrote just as many books about psychotherapy and psychodrama as he wrote about society and social change. So in many ways, I, th I think of Moreno as not just a, a therapist or a psychiatrist or a clinician, but he also was working in the macro uh, field. He is a good role model for bridging the gap between macro social work and clinical social work while emphasizing meso social work, group work, as one of the bridges between the two. Uh, Moreno suggests that Every individual is tied to their social atom as closely as we are to our bodies. And that even when our relationships change, our social atom, the constellation within it, tends to maintain consist consistency. Um, that it ten the, the constellation tends to repeat itself. Uh, in another publication in 1941, Moreno writes, this is a quote, as the individual projects his emotions into the groups around him, 
and as the members of these groups in turn project their emotions toward him, a pattern of attractions and repulsions, as projected from both sides, can be discerned on the threshold between individual and group. This pattern is called a social atom. So this is what Moreno means by the social atom. You can see an example of a social atom, and this is an example uh, from uh, chapter 5 in my book. As you can see here, we use different objects, uh, different shapes, uh, corresponding to different genders. Again, the traditional way of doing this would be to use triangles to represent men or male, and to use circles to represent uh, female. Uh, for a while, I was suggesting that we use stars to represent any transgender or non-binary persons on the social atom. Uh, but I, I really like the idea of getting rid of the shapes altogether and letting clients use whatever shape they feel like it to represent the different people uh, on their social atom. I think it really honors the uniqueness of each person's personality rather than focusing it more so on their gender. Traditionally, uh, one would use squares or rectangles to represent objects or entities or organizations. And then you can see in, in the key here, we also use uh, dotted lines or dashed lines in the shape to represent when somebody's deceased. So in this example, you can see that the person who draw this, drew the social atom they have a lost relationship with Sandy, who is someone who's deceased. You can see, based on the squiggly line there, that they have a conflicting relationship with Dan. And you can see by the solid lines in the other relationships that they have uh, some uh, a number of connected relationships within their life. Now, it's important to keep in mind that the social atom is, of course, a self-assessment. Um, and you could experiment with trying to draw someone else's social atom based on your perception of their social life. That would be an interesting experiment to have a child draw their own social atom and to have that child's parent draw their child's social atom and compare their parent's per perception of their client's social atom or their child's social atom with the child's self-perception of their social atom. Uh, you could do that in a number of different ways. Partners could do that for each other, a client and therapist. Um, there's different ways that, that you could experiment with the social atom. Uh, so the social atom can be a pen to paper assessment. It's often used as a warm up for psychodrama or for psychodramatic sculpting, which we'll talk about it in some of the other videos here. And it can be used on its own as an exercise. Uh, we could put the social atom into action by uh, having a the group identify a protagonist, taking the protagonist's social atom and asking them to choose different people in the group to play the roles of the different people on their social atom and they could stand in the center of their social atom in the group and explore their relationships in an embodied way. We could have them reverse roles with the different people in their social atom, uh, offer doubling statements from the different people in their social atom, experiment with nonverbal messages, body postures, and positionings uh, within the, the their social atom and their different relationships, and experiment with creating change within the social atom in action, exploring what it might feel like to uh, change some of the relationships in the social atom and concretize that change uh, through action. Uh, we'll talk more about that in some of the other videos as well. But the social atom really is core to sociometry theory and to sociometry practice. So, I, I really hope that you found this video helpful. If you wanted to read more about these connections, you can check out Chapter 5 in the book.
Again, you can download that the entire book for free online, and we'll put a link to the book in the in the description here. Uh, if you found the book helpful, it would really go a long ways to consider writing an Amazon review, an honest review about the book. If you found this video helpful, um, it would also help me and help others see this content if you were to like the video or subscribe to the video. Uh, comment on the video. Let me know uh, what stood out to you about this presentation of sociometry. Let me know if you have any questions about sociometry. Let me know if there's other videos that I haven't made yet that would be really helpful for you that you'd like to see in the future. I'm really interested in hearing from you and hearing um, about how this content lands on you, how it's useful for you, or, or how it challenges you, how it fits with ways that you understand other theories, other ways of working. I'm really interested in connecting. So thanks again for watching this video and check out some of the other videos on our channel here.